The Fallout series tagline is based on the idea that war never changes, and this is evidently true. In each entry to the series, a player character is able to witness conflicts between the emergent groups of the post-war world. From the wars between the NCR and the Enclave, the Legion and the NCR, and the Brotherhood and the Enclave, war is seen to be the foundation of the series. Much of the previously mentioned conflicts are able to be directly influenced by our player. You could even argue that some of the outcomes of said wars are entirely dependent on the decisions that we make. However, today we'll be focusing on one of the most crucial wars ever fought in the post-war United States that we, as the player character, are unable to personally witness or take part in. This being the war between the Brotherhood of Steel and the New California Republic. Prior to the outbreak of war, the relationship between the Brotherhood of Steel and the NCR was relatively cordial. After the destruction of the Unity, the Brotherhood is stated to have assisted fellow human settlements against the remaining mutants. They are confirmed to have remained out of the power structure however, staying true to their insular nature. The NCR was officially voted into existence in 2189 as a federation of five states, with one of these states named Maxon, after the Brotherhood's founder, Roger Maxon. Terminal entries found in the Citadel indicate that the state of Maxon was built in proximity to the Lost Hills Bunker, the headquarters of the Brotherhood High Command, with the fledgling state enjoying the protection provided by the Brotherhood. One of the other states of the NCR, the Hub, had built strong economic ties to the Brotherhood before they'd even been incorporated into the Republic, since caravans had plied the Brotherhood bunkers as early as 2150. As late as 2141, Brotherhood outposts can be found within the capital of the NCR itself, Shady Sands. Other similar outposts were stated to be located within San Francisco and the Den, seeming to act as a form of consulate or embassy for the Brotherhood personnel within the NCR. However cordial they may have initially been, relations between the two groups began to sour once the Republic's ambition clashed with the Brotherhood's staunch ideals. The exact time period that the war had broken out is unknown. Since the NCR Brotherhood are at peace in 2241, and are then stated to have been at war for some time by Fallout New Vegas in the year of 2281, there's at least a 40 year period in which the war had broken out. By the power of deduction, we can state with certainty that the war was ongoing at least a decade earlier in 2271, and potentially even as far back as 2261. Veronica states that her parents were killed in battle against the NCR when she was just a young child. Given that she is 26 at the time of New Vegas, there is at most a 20 year time difference since the battle that claimed her parents' lives. President Kimball claims that Private Jeremy Watson suffered through the Brotherhood War when he was a child. Given the fact that Private Watson appears to be a young person of similar age to Veronica, this would also support the idea of the conflict being ongoing since the 2260s. More evidence of this also comes from Elder Maxon's father Jonathan, a high-ranking paladin who was killed near the NCR when he was just a child. Since he is 10 in the year of 2271 in Fallout 3, we can confidently state that this conflict would have been occurring within the 2260s also. Regardless, the cause for the war brewed over due to disagreements between how advanced technology should be handled within the wasteland. Founded immediately after the Great War, the Brotherhood of Steel were dedicated to the preservation of technology and human knowledge. Technology had led to the outbreak of the Great War, and so the Brotherhood devoted themselves to safeguarding it to prevent another devastating conflict from occurring. In theory, this was a noble goal, protecting humanity from itself by keeping dangerous technology out of their hands. In practice, this involved wresting technology from the hands of all that they did not deem worthy of it which was basically everyone who was not in the Brotherhood. This goal had been compounded by the Brotherhood's growing insecurity of their place in the wasteland. During Fallout 2, Brotherhood members can be heard lamenting the technological might of the Enclave, with their members decrying that the Order was no longer the power that they had once been. However, once the Enclave had been defeated by the Chosen One, the Brotherhood were once again the most technologically superior faction in the wasteland, and this time, they meant to stay that way. However, while the Brotherhood waned, the NCR were on the rise. What had originally been a mere collection of like-minded communities had emerged as one of the most defined post-war civilizations in the known world. 
In order to advance the interests of itself and its citizens, the NCR began research and acquisition of sophisticated tech. This, combined with their growing expansion in all directions of the wasteland to acquire living space for their citizens, began to place the Republic at odds with their one-time ally. Alongside the fact that the NCR personnel were beginning to equip and collect technology that the Brotherhood felt was rightfully theirs, the Brotherhood viewed the emerging Republic as a potential threat to their power, given that there was one million inhabitants of the Republic by the year of 2241. The Brotherhood began to police the states and frontiers of the Republic, seeking to appropriate tech from its citizens. The focus of this was particularly on limiting access to military technologies such as energy weapons. The result was NCR citizens having their prized laser rifle, or a plasma gun family heirloom that their grandfather had looted off a mutant he killed, stolen by an external power armor clad order outside of the Republic's rule. Initial attempts at reconciliation were attempted by the Republic ambassadors, who sought to dissuade the Brotherhood forces from roaming their cities and harassing their citizens. For the Brotherhood, to not do so would be in direct violation of one of their most sacred oaths, which led to the formal declaration of war between the two parties. The Brotherhood found themselves at an advantage at the initial outbreak of war. Steadfast in their belief that their cause was just, they saw victory as an inevitability. The Brotherhood had also existed for many centuries at this point, fighting in a plethora of conflicts as a group, and were therefore no strangers to war. Clad in power armor and bolstered by exceptional weaponry, their forces were unparalleled in the post-war wasteland. In comparison, the NCR had only fought in one fairly localized war against the Enclave, and this was alongside the Brotherhood. Although possessing a highly developed military force, much of the Republic's manpower came from their conscripted civilian base, made up of unblooded and untested men and women. Where the Brotherhood fought with plasma rifles and wore power armor, the NCR fought with service rifles and wore flask jackets. The Brotherhood paladins and knights initially steamrolled over the Republic troops, inflicting immense losses upon Republic forces. Bases and outposts fell to their steel-clad adversaries, with some whole towns captured by the Brotherhood. The NCR buckled under the enormous loss faced on a war on their home front, having never experienced war in this form. In these early years of the war, the Brotherhood almost won entirely. However, despite their tremendous advantages of fancy equipment, unit tactics, and unshakable zeal, the Brotherhood was unable to match the NCR in one key area, numbers. Despite the devastating casualties inflicted on Republic troops, another trooper was always ready to take the place of each that had fallen in battle. In contrast, each eliminated knight and paladin was an irreplaceable loss that the Brotherhood could not easily fill. The Brotherhood began to tremble as it was literally buried underneath an unending wave of Republic soldiers, and suffered an immense loss of morale, given that they were unable to stand against what they had just considered to be up-jump tribals. But as stated by Mr. House, ideological purity and shiny power armor don't count for much when you're outnumbered 15 to 1. No longer able to face the Republic in direct combat, the Brotherhood changed tactics. The majority of their forces retreated to their fortified bunkers, while guerrilla teams spread across the Republic with the goal of committing acts of terrorism to force the NCR to capitulate. One of the most consequential raids was the Brotherhood's decision to attack the NCR's gold reserves. From their conception, the NCR established its own currency. This was done by minting gold coins, which were then used to back their paper money, in an effort to lessen the reliance on bottle caps. However, once these gold reserves had been destroyed by the Brotherhood, Panicked NCR citizens rushed to transfer their paper money for the remaining reserves of gold. Unfortunately, they now discovered it was worth much less than it previously had been, leading to extreme financial loss across the entire Republic. As a mercantile nation, this was felt deeply. Losing lives is one thing, but losing their money was another altogether. The NCR government responded by removing the gold standard completely and establishing a fiat currency. However, the result of the Brotherhood raids meant that many citizens distrusted their own government's money, preferring instead to deal in caps. And this feeling remains even decades into the future, as NCR citizens in Fallout New Vegas moan that one bottle cap is only equal to two and a half Republic dollars. NCR forces were eventually able to eliminate the Brotherhood forces on the surface, and began launching their own counterattacks on their subterranean bunkers that hosted the Brotherhood. Such an undertaking was one that the Republic did not consider lightly. 
Entire platoons of NCR troops had been killed in their attempts to crack open these underground readouts. Yet the alternative of allowing a belligerent foe to regroup and renew their assault was one that the Republic could not allow. A total of six Brotherhood bunkers were confirmed to have been successfully defeated by the Republic. Four of these self-destructed, taking the Brotherhood and their foes with them, but two were able to be captured with the spoils of war intact. It was likely from these captured bunkers that the NCR was able to acquire large caches of Brotherhood power armor, which was in turn utilized by the NCR heavy troopers. With the loss of their once thought impenetrable bunkers, the Brotherhood truly felt vulnerable. Their mission changed from their once noble goal of safeguarding humanity to mere survival. The result was more or less a stalemate. NCR civilians went back to their daily lives, NCR troops resumed their usual operations, and the Brotherhood remained hiding within their remaining lairs. It does appear some conflict continued to brew between the two groups as late as 2280. Colonel Moore is stated to have four tours against the Brotherhood to her name with one of these being concluded shortly before her arrival in the Mojave in 2281. Ultimately, the war had technically never been declared over, given that the Brotherhood refused to concede defeat to such an unworthy foe. Yet their power had definitely been broken, and the threat that they posed was no longer what it once was. The NCR's elite forces were reallocated to different areas out of their core territory, such as Baja and Nevada, to face threats more insidious than the Brotherhood. Yet, the Western Front was not the last theatre of war between the two factions. During the height of the NCR Brotherhood War, the High Council of the Brotherhood had decided to send Elder Elijah out east to form a new chapter within the Mojave Wasteland in 2260. Forming a base of operations in the Hidden Valley Bunkers, the Mojave chapter quickly found the pre-war solar plant Helios-1. For a time, the chapter lived the high life. Brotherhood members scoured the waste freely for years, locating scores of technology and facing little to no opposition, which enamored Elijah as he began to devote himself to unlocking its secrets. Despite objections from his paladins, Elijah decided to make Helios-1 their primary base of operations. His obsession was such that he chose to ignore requests to settle Hoover Dam, or to destroy the emergent Van Graaff crime family who dealt in energy weapons. Most damningly, he also chose to ignore the NCR forces who entered the region in 2273. Initially, the Republic was focused on securing their prize of Hoover Dam and negotiating with the other main power of the region, Mr. House. However, by 2274, skirmishes and guerrilla fighting had begun to erupt between the two groups, much the same as on the West Coast. The NCR, securing the region and understanding the need to eliminate their long-term foe, launched an assault on Helios-1, labelled Operation Sunburst, in 2276. Elder Elijah ignored the fact that Helios-1 was an incredibly indefensible location. While his commanders argued that it was better to fight amidst the rocky canyons near Hidden Valley, Elijah instead believed that it was close to unlocking the weaponry of Helios-1, and once he had, the NCR would fall. Brotherhood troops dug in and tried to fortify their positions, but were left dangerously exposed on all sides. NCR troops began pouring in from all directions, seeking to force an opening to dislodge their foes. The knights and paladins stood valiantly, and decimated large swaths of troopers with their high-tech weaponry. But the same problems with the Western War soon became evident. The Brotherhood were outnumbered by 20 to 1 by some estimates. A wave of troopers would be annihilated only for reinforcements to immediately fill the gap, whereas every paladin that died was a huge blow to the Mojave chapter. A rout began to follow, as the chapter was forced to retreat to Hidden Valley, with half of their soldiers left dead or dying in the aftermath of the brutal fighting. Elder Elijah had abandoned his troops, with head paladin McNamara forced to assume command. The Mojave chapter's power was broken. A full lockdown was announced, with only supply runs, limited night patrols, and the occasional recon mission allowed. The rest of the time, the chapter languished in the dark, desolate and forlorn. With their manpower depleted, the remaining Brotherhood forces tried to stay sharp via training simulations. However, as stated by Joshua Sawyer, most of the paladins of the Mojave chapter had been rapidly promoted due to the death of their forebearers and were relatively inexperienced. The chapter knows that they are at risk of dying out, but still remain trapped in their bunker, terrified that the bear was still hunting them. In truth, the NCR had bigger fish to fry. The first Battle of Hoover Dam broke out a year later in 2277, when Caesar's Legion crossed the Colorado to lay claim to the Mojave. 
Although the attack was repelled, the NCR were left scarred by their experience. The military presence in the region was increased fivefold in their goal to annex the region and lay claim to the resources, most notably Hoover Dam. However, it would be incorrect to state that they had forgotten the Brotherhood's presence entirely. In 2281, leading up to the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, Colonel Moore expresses concern for a simultaneous Brotherhood assault on Republic troops. While many of the commanders had theorised that the Brotherhood had left the region, she had correctly deduced that they had holed up in Hidden Valley, given the number of missing NCR scouts from that region. The courier can then be tasked to eliminate the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood, preferably by destroying their reactor. One pathway involves the courier following her orders, decimating the Brotherhood, and concluding the Mojave branch of the NCR Brotherhood war conclusively. However, another option does exist, which involves brokering a peace deal between the chapter and the NCR. This truce involved the Brotherhood supporting the NCR against a legion in the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, with knights and even a paladin locatable at the site. After the conflict, the Brotherhood assisted the NCR by patrolling I-15 and Highway 95 in their attempts to pacify the region. In return, the NCR were negotiated with to return all suits of salvage power armour to their original owners. Obviously, the end result of the Mojave Brotherhood NCR war is open to play a decision. The Brotherhood forces can be destroyed on orders of either the Legion, Mr. House or the NCR, concluding the campaign entirely. Alternatively, they can be spared via the truce. The aforementioned peace deal is stated to be brokered despite the continued hostilities between the two factions in the West. It's unknown what this would mean for the Mojave chapter in the long term. The chapter has no communication with the High Command in Lost Hills, and so ultimately would not have any knowledge of the status or orders of the High Elder and Council. It's hard to tell if hostilities would once again just flare up if ordered to do so by the Brotherhood High Command, or naturally, if the more conservative Brotherhood members of the Mojave chapter chose to launch their own attacks against the NCR. On the Republic side, Colonel Moore openly hates the Brotherhood based on her own experiences against the group. Indeed, if peace is negotiated with them, she vindictively has Ambassador Crocker removed from his post and tarnishes the crew's reputation with the NCR. In cut post-game content, she states she's been promoted to Brigadier General, wielding enormous power and influence. Joshua Sawyer himself had stated that her response to overtures of peace and an actual brokered peace with the Brotherhood showed that her motives aren't really the NCR's interests, but based on her own vendettas. Ultimately, it stands to reason that even with the peace deal reached, there may be a strong chance that the conflict reignites between the two factions in the future. And finally, I believe it's important to discuss what the war may have looked like after 2281. As mentioned, the Brotherhood NCR war was confirmed to still be in effect at this year, having raged for decades at this point. The war is undeniably in the NCR's favour, since they had reached the apex of their power and possessed the most advanced military in the post-war world. The Brotherhood are seen to have suffered a severe loss in power and influence, being a shadow of what they once were. Even the family tree of their founder Roger Maxson had seemingly been whittled away to a single branch, given that his descendant, a high-ranking paladin named Joshua Maxson, was killed near the New California Republic. There evidently was also some form of internal conflict within the Western Division, given that a terminal entry indicates that Jonathan's son, young Arthur Maxson, was sent to the Citadel to be fostered by Elder Owen Lyons. The reason for this decision was due to internal conflicts amongst the Western Brotherhood of Steel that created an unsafe environment for the child. It was believed that the Citadel, despite being located in hostile territory, would increase his probability of survival. In contrast, despite their losses on the West Coast, the division of the East Coast Brotherhood had reached a new apex of power in the year of 2287. The chapter had regained its footing after the defeat of the Enclave and the ascension of Arthur Maxon to Elder. In possession of a flying military stronghold, a vertebrate fleet, and immense technological might, the East Coast Brotherhood was able to project power across the eastern seaboard, from the capital wasteland to the Commonwealth. Upon Arthur's promotion, the Eastern Division regained contact with their West Coast brothers. Communications had been cut following the High Command's disapproval of Elder Lion's peace efforts in the Capital Wasteland, with the East Coast having no knowledge of what was happening on the other side of the Waste. The Lost Hills Bunker, with the High Elder of the Brotherhood of Steel and High Council, is evidently still in operation as late as 2287. Terminal entries found on the Pridwin state that Maxon has the full support of the Elders back on the West Coast, 
who have proudly reported they've been eradicating cults that have popped up, worshipping Maxon as though he's some kind of god. The idea that the West Coast Brotherhood, after nearly being close to annihilation by the NCR, have the ability to provide support to Maxon's chapter is telling. The additional fact that his rise to power has been deified by a number of cults, as well as the West Coast Brotherhood utilising manpower to neutralise these groups, shows that they must not be as worried about the NCR as they were before. This could be for a variety of reasons. Maybe the NCR's peace efforts with the Mojave chapter allowed for a full-blown peace accord to be reached with the Lost Hills High Elders. Maybe the NCR had collapsed in on itself, or from outside conflicts, with the Brotherhood emerging once more as a dominant force in the region. Or maybe it's because Bethesda has barely kept the law from its own previous entries to the series intact. Looking at you, Billy the Ghoul Kid. Bethesda therefore may not have cared to look or disregarded the storytelling and lore that Obsidian had constructed for the Brotherhood on the West Coast. This job was then left to Fallout nerds such as myself to try and piece together the different aspects of lore into a conclusive story that makes sense. Anyway, this was a full history of the NCR Brotherhood of Steel War. It's always fascinating to look into the stories that aren't shown in front of our eyes, but are built upon by storytelling devices to help make the in-game world the dynamic and functional environment that it is. This was a topic that I really enjoyed researching, and I hope that you found it just as interesting. Hopefully, the fact that you're still watching in this last minute means that you did. Please feel free to let me know if there's any other Fallout topics you'd like me to delve into, and I'll see you next time.